Besides the usual screening tools you're going to get at each trimester, this lecture is going to cover some advanced antenatal testing, that is, assessing baby later on in gestation when it's ready to come out. And the indication for these procedures generally is going to be either decreased fetal movement assessed by mom or a high risk pregnancy with medical disease. The idea is you want to assess is baby doing okay and can stay in the oven longer or is baby in distress and needs to come out right now. In general, you're also going to pick the tool that is least invasive both for mom and for baby. So what I want to go through first is the algorithm, the decision tree you're going to make and then go back through and understand what you're actually looking for with each test. So let's start with the algorithm. First, mom is going to come in either as a high-risk pregnancy or because she thinks baby is moving less, decreased fetal movement. The first test you're going to do is the non-stress test. All this does is assesses baby's heart rate. And what you're looking for is variability and normal rate. You want a moderate variability and a normal rate. If you have that, it's said to be reassuring. A reactive non-stress test with good variability and normal rate is reassuring. If mom came in for decreased fetal movement, you can stop testing. Baby's doing good. If she was high risk, you're going to continually assess her every week. Now, if the non-stress test was not reactive, you didn't see moderate variability, or the heart rates were not in the correct range, you're going to try vibroacoustic stimulation. Baby might just be asleep. And vibroacoustic stimulation is an ultrasound that sends in waves. Basically, you start do, using a jackhammer next to baby. So baby's going to wake up. And you repeat the NST. And so if you've got moderate variability and a normal heart rate, it's said to be reactive. That's reassuring. If decreased fetal movement, stop. If for, in, for a high-risk pregnancy, repeat every week. But if the vibroacoustic stimulation with NST was non-reactive, now you're kind of worried. Now this is a sensitive test, not a specific one. So it rules in babies that are actually doing well, even though they failed the NST. So now you want to do a more specific test. So you use the biophysical profile. The biophysical profile is sort of like an intrauterine APGAR score. It's ranked on a score of 0 to 10 based on the NST, some amniotic fluid findings, and what baby is doing in utero. If the biophysical profile is good, that is a score of 8 to 10, that's reassuring. And the NST brought in a baby who's actually doing well, and you can stop for decreased fetal movement or high risk repeat Q weekly. If on the other hand, baby is doing really poorly. If it's obvious that it's doing bad, a score of zero to two, fetal demise is imminent. It may have actually already occurred. And you have to deliver now. And in general, because this is a very severe condition and you are screening mom, she's not actually even in contractions yet, you're probably going to do a C-section. But if you're in between, that is, you're on the fence, you're any score not two or less or eight or greater, you're not really sure if baby's doing well or not. So now you have to decide, based on their gestational age, what is the next step? And here's the logic. If you're on the fence and they are term, greater than 36 weeks, you're going to get very little benefit from staying in the oven longer. And so, if you're greater than 36 weeks and on the fence about how well baby is doing, just deliver. There is higher risk to staying in at this point than coming out. So this baby simply gets delivered. And this delivery can be induced by Pitocin. Baby's not doing very sick, 
It's just, let's get started, induce Pitocin, mom can have vaginal delivery, C-section if she wants. But if it's not term, you have to decide, will there be benefit staying in the oven? You do the contraction stress test. So this is the NST now induced by Pitocin. And what you're looking for is decelerations. In the non-stress test, you're looking for accelerations. In the contraction stress test, you're looking for decels. So if you see any late decelerations or fetal bradycardia, that is a sign that fetal demise is imminent and you need to deliver. Again, because you're inducing this test with Pitocin, most likely by C-section. If, on the other hand, you don't see any of those D-cells, that you have a reassuring contraction stress test, there are no late decelerations. Now it's actually beneficial to grow baby. You're gonna keep baby in mom as long as possible to get baby a little bit older. Chances are you're not gonna make it to term because the baby is doing so poorly that you've gotten down to CST, but you wanna leave it in as long as possible to get as close to term as you're able to do. But you're also gonna to have to admit mom and keep a close eye on her because you don't want that uh, on the fence okay baby to turn into a dead baby. And you need to consider giving steroids if baby's lungs are not fully developed. Okay. So this is the decision tree we're gonna make. And the three tests we're really talking about are the non-stress test, the biophysical profile, and the CST. Let's learn more about those individual tests to what you're supposed to look for. Let's start with the non-stress test. The NST. By definition, it's non-stress, so it's going to be done when there are no contractions. And we're going to be assessing baby's heart rate. The patient that this is indicated in is any mom who feels that there's decreased fetal emotion or a high risk pregnancy. What you are looking for is variability. You want there to be moderate variability. If there's too much variability, that's a bad sign. If there's too little variability, that's a bad sign. And what you're also looking for in, additional, in addition to variability is accelerations. What you want follows the 15, 15, 2, and 20 rule. You want increases in the heart rate, accelerations, that occur 15 beats per minute in increase, that last 15 seconds, that occur twice in 20 minutes. Accelerations that are 15 beats high, that are 15 seconds long, occurring twice in 20 minutes. This is the definition of an acceleration in a baby who's greater than 30 weeks. It's 10, 10, 2, and 20 for a baby who's less than 30 weeks. And based on the results of the test, if it is reassuring, that is, baby passes the test, you can stop. If it is non-reassuring, that is, baby fails, that is, there is not moderate variability and not accelerations the way you anticipate, you move on to the next step, the biophysical profile. So what does variability and accelerations look like? First, you have to know that fetal bradycardia is defined by a heart rate less than 110, and that fetal tachycardia is defined by a fetal heart rate greater than 160. Now let's talk about variability. Moderate variability is a heart rate within bradycardia tachycardic ranges that is 110 to 160, with decent variability second to second. An example of low variability will look like a flat line. Baby's heart rate may be 180, but there's no variability. 
Likewise, severe variability is just all over the place. No variability, extreme variability, both bad signs. What you want is moderate variability. For accelerations, what you're looking for is an elevation in the beats per minute by 15 that last 15 seconds each that occur twice in 20 minutes. So in a 20 minute time span, you should see at least two accelerations that increase by 15 beats per minute and last 15 seconds long. If the NST shows both moderate variability and at least two accelerations in 20 minutes, it is reassuring and you can stop. But if it fails either of these tests, you have to move on to the biophysical profile. The biophysical profile or the BPP. This is still done without any contractions and is essentially the APGAR in utero. Patients who are indicated for a biophysical profile are those who fail the NST. Don't forget about vibroacoustic stimulation. Here's how you do the biophysical profile. You're going to take into account the NST. And you're going to do an ultrasound in order to get the amniotic fluid index. But you're also going to do an ultrasound to look at the baby itself. The baby is going to be assessed for its breathing, its muscular tone, and its overall movement. Each piece of the biophysical profile is worth two points. And what you do is add up the sum and treat accordingly. If less than or equal to two, you deliver, generally by C-section because contractions haven't even started yet and fetal demise is imminent. If greater than or equal to eight, baby's doing well and you simply give reassurance. If it's anything in between, you go on to the next step, contraction stress test. Here's how you assess the amniotic fluid index. You're going to divide mom's belly into four quadrants. You're going to take an ultrasound probe and you're going to measure the depth of amniotic fluid in each of the four quadrants. You're going to take the largest pocket of fluid you can find from each of the four quadrants and sum them together. This is the amniotic fluid index. A normal amniotic fluid index is greater than five. A reassuring gets the full two points, amniotic fluid index, is between 8 and 25. Oligohydramnios, that is too little amniotic fluid, is less than 5. And polyhydramnios, that is too much amniotic fluid, is greater than 25. Oligohydramnios is indicative of decreased urinary output, generally from placental insufficiency or simply renal agenesis. Polyhydramnios is usually indicative of good renal function, but baby isn't swallowing the amniotic fluid the way they should, indicative of a gastrointestinal deficiency. But the biophysical profile gives you a scoring system that tells you what to do next. Let's now talk about the contraction stress test. Now, it's, you have to realize that the contraction stress test can be induced with Pitocin. But it is also what you do in every patient who is admitted for delivery. Because there are going to be contractions now, either induced by you or simply present with mom's delivery. In order to be considered an adequate test, you need three contractions in 10 minutes. 
what you are assessing is decelerations. That is baby's response to mom's contractions. In the non-stress test that did not have any contractions, you are looking for accelerations. In the contraction stress testing where there are contractions, you're assessing for decelerations. Patients who have CST are those who fail the biophysical profile. These are often induced with Pitocin. Or they are a patient admitted for delivery. Because every mom that comes in to deliver in a hospital is going to have a tocometer placed. She's going to have a fetal heart tracing ready to go. And so the way you do this is you place an intrauterine device that assesses contractions and can then give you information about decelerations relative to her contractions. What you're looking for are early D cells, variable D cells, and late D cells. These are benign and the delivery can continue. Late D cells are bad and are an indication for delivery, as is fetal bradycardia. So if you see late D cells or fetal bradycardia, you deliver immediately. If she's in the middle of delivery, you don't say, oh, let's just keep going and see how she does. This baby needs to come out now. And either you're going to use C-section, that is if she is station zero or less, that is still inside mom, or you can use forceps or vacuum delivery if she's station one or two. You can see OB operations for more details regarding the means of delivery. But if you see any late D cells or fetal bradycardia, baby's gotta come out right now you will definitely have one or two questions about decelerations. So let's look at what decelerations look at, look like. This is a contraction stress test. So mom is gonna have at least three contractions in 10 minutes. And the way you tell what type of deceleration it is, is relative to the contraction. An early D cell will mirror the contraction of the uterus. That is, the lowest dip of the deceleration will line up perfectly with the point of maximal contractility. So they exactly mirror the contractions. An early deceleration is indicative only of head compression. It is benign and baby does not need to be delivered. Variable D cells are exactly that. They occur completely independently of contractions. They often have an abrupt onset and abrupt recovery. Variable D cells are a product of cord compression. And while that sounds bad because that's the fetal blood supply, baby compensates. So she, the baby will not be tachycardic, bradycardic, but will have variable decelerations. You'll see these periodically, those are okay. The ones you have to know how to, find, how to spot, because this is the way you're gonna save a baby's life, is by identifying late decelerations. And late decelerations are called late because they occur after the contraction. After the point of maximum contraction, the late D cell begins.
the point of maximum contractility marks initiation of the late deceleration. If you see a late deceleration, this is indicative of fetal placental insufficiency. That sounds bad because it is bad. So in this lecture, what we've talked about is an algorithm for assessing babies that are near term to figure out if they can stay in longer and continue to develop or if they need to be delivered promptly. This testing begins with a non-stress test where you're assessing for variability and accelerations. The biophysical profile is the next step, which gives an in utero APGAR score. It's not really the APGAR, but it's based on the same principles. If the biophysical profile is normal, you can simply just go home. If it's really bad, they need to be delivered immediately. And if you're on the fence, you're going to use gestational age to determine whether you need a contraction stress test. Probably the yield thing in this entire section is the contraction stress test because either it's indicated by biophysical profile where you induce the stress test with Pitocin or it is going to be every patient you'll see in the OB ward who is getting ready to deliver and you need to be able to identify the late decelerations. Late decelerations are the thing that marks fetal distress. If you don't catch a late deceleration the baby will die. That is antenatal testing. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.